live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Check. Hey, Matt, that microphone's dead. The batteries are good, but the microphone wasn't working. Hey, y'all, how you doing? We're rocking and rolling now. Welcome to the Science Cafe. My name is Chris. I am your host tonight. And this is our weekly Thursday night activity here at the Science Museum, Museum of Natural Sciences. So thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about some really cool science. But by show of hands, how many of you are here for the science? Okay, okay, good. I was worried. How many of you are here for art? Oh, wait, that's too many. This is, this is just a science museum. Why are you here for art, too? No, these things are intricately connected, aren't they? Right, they're a part of the larger world that we live in. Science and art are what we do as humans. We make science. We do art. We make science and all of that other cool stuff. So. Tonight, we bring the two together in some really cool and interesting ways. Um, our guest, Dr. Diane Markoff, is from North Carolina Central University and the Triangle University's Nuclear Laboratory. And in the bio that we had for her, she talked about spending a lot of time near and around and doing experiments with particle accelerators. So in my mind, looking at tonight's topic of how physics and fine art are coming together, I was imagining her taking like really nice paintings to particle accelerators and then smashing them together, <laughs> fine art colliding, and then you see what comes out at the end, right? I think that's called modern art, right? But they didn't like that one, okay. But what can physics and the techniques of particle accelerators teach us about what's going on in the world of fine art. What can we learn about paintings using physics? And what makes that interesting in the first place? Right? Well, why is it exciting? Why are there so many people here to try to figure out what we're learning about human-created fine art using the tools and techniques of science? And so that's why, that's why I think you're all here. That's why I'm here. And I think we should go ahead and jump in, see some exciting paintings, but more importantly, dive into the world of particle physics with tonight's guest, Dr. Diane Markoff. Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming out. And uh, hopefully my goal for this evening is to give you an appreciation of uh, how physics is impacting our understanding of art. So we'll dive right in. First of all, if we're going to do analysis of cultural heritage objects, and that's not just paintings, that's going to be any other uh, you know, ceramics or anything else, then we uh, one of the goals or the objectives of any analysis is going to be that we want to verify the authenticity. We want to determine materials and how it was constructed. Maybe we, can, we can't go back and ask somebody in the ancient time, how did you do this? So what we have to do is find clues to figure out how did they construct something, what materials did they use, and things of that sort. And so the question is whether or not physics and physics techniques can actually answer some of these questions. We, all ha we also have constraints. We have to think about that we can't just cut up the painting and mush it up somewhere and then put it into an, an accelerator or something like that. We can't uh, destroy the painting. We can't destroy the ceramic. So we have to think about non-destructive testing or at least minimal damage or alteration to the piece. We have to think about uh, the piece may be very fragile and can't be moved. So how do you bring a large painting or a painting on a wall 
or a very fragile piece of pottery to the accelerator or to, to some place where there's some uh, uh, technique that you want to use. So there has to be some mobility. Uh, that can happen in some cases, but we also have to think about mobility of bringing the, the art object to, or, or bringing the, uh, the analysis technique to the art object itself. And it also has to be reliable. Can't be complicated. <laughs> That's not going to be useful. Okay, so I, what I want to start out with a little bit of physics. We're going to start out with what you're very, very familiar with. How do you see objects? Well, how you see an object is there's some source of light. We have lights here, quite bright. We have lights that are all over the room. We have the sun. We have a source of light. That light then hits the uh, target that you're trying to look at, and the light from the target has to go to your eyes. Your eyes are what we consider the detector. Your eyes are actually the first particle detector that we know of. And it's a very good particle detector indeed. It has limitations, but it sees visible light. That's what we've been developed to do. We see visible light. So we have reflection of a source of light, visible light, that goes to the detector and the detector sees that light. Okay. Now I want to think about more than just visible light. So here's a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. And there it is. Okay, so here we have visible light that's uh, in the middle of the spectrum here. And you can see the colors. And we're going to go to longer wavelengths in this direction here. And we're going to go to smaller wavelengths in this direction here. So the red is a longer wavelength than the violets, the blues, the ultra, uh, ultraviolet. The infrared is a longer wavelength. We get to microwaves that are even longer. And radio waves, as you know, are, are quite long. So here's the scale of the wavelengths. So radio waves sit about a mountain size. It's about a kilometer. OK, so that's about a mountain size. And uh, now we can get into microwaves. That's about a ladybug size on the order of centimeters. Then we can get to the uh, infrared, and that's on the level of uh, bacteria. Um, cell, actually, cells first, then bacteria is here, and that starts to get close to the visible. Then below the visible, in this small wavelength region here, we get the ultraviolet. We keep going, and that's actually going to be molecules right here. And then if we keep going to the x-ray, that's about the level of the atom. So we think about the ultraviolet is on the level of molecules. It's on the length of the molecules. The x-rays are on the length of atoms. Now if we go to smaller wavelengths, we're really, really small wavelengths in here, then we have gamma rays and we go to the nucleus size. So we're going to concentrate on the region between x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, and a little bit of infrared. That's where it's going to be the most useful for our analysis at this point. So the other thing I want to say, just to explain, is you can imagine if you've ever played jump rope. You, you, know, you play with a, a rope, yeah, and it's pretty easy to turn around. Have you ever sort of like decided, OK, I'm going like, to send a little pulse down that rope to the other person just for fun, right? So you send a pulse. Well, imagine if you had to keep sending a pulse at a really tight pulse really fast. You'd have to put in a lot of energy to do that. So what happens is the higher the frequency we have here, the higher the frequency is going to be the greater the energy. The greater the energy, higher the frequency, the shorter those wavelengths. You could just imagine a rope that you really have to bounce up and down. The longer wavelengths, lower energies, lower frequencies. So that's an important thing to keep, keep an eye on, the electromagnetic spectrum. You're very familiar with the visible. I actually I brought a, uh, an ultraviolet uh, um, light source here. But unfortunately, with all the lights here, it's very hard to see. So I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, pass on that. OK, there's also, if you uh, look at the uh, white light, I, I think many of you are familiar that if you look at white light, white light is actually composed of many different colors. 
right? So if you look through a prism, then you would see that, that the, the light gets broken up. So you can imagine that white light comes in and the prism then acts to break up the light in some way, all right? Because the light travels through that glass. And so because of the different wavelengths, you're gonna get the light in different places. So I brought with me here for the people here, these are spectrographs. If you would like to look at them, I'm gonna just hand these out, I just would like them back at the end. Um, and what you can do is you can look through this and look at, thank you. And what you could do is just look at a white light. And when you look through, you'll see the different colors. And that's the spectrum that you're seeing. So what I want you to get a, uh, an idea of is what is a spectrum? And when we say a spectrum, what we're looking at are the different wavelengths, the different colors of light. And they will line up just like they do here on the uh, spectrum. So that's, uh, so that's what I wanted you to get a, a sense of what that means to have a spectrum. Okay, so now, you've, now you're all experts on the electromagnetic spectrum. We're gonna move on. There are three primary ways that the light is going to interact with material. First is transmission. Now, if you have a piece of glass, then you can pretty much see through that glass. There's gonna be some reflection. We're seeing some reflection here off of the windows, but you primarily see through. That's transmission, okay? And if the light hits the surface and comes back, then we have reflection. If the light gets absorbed in some way, then we call it absorption. So those are the three main ways that light is going to, or, or electromagnetic waves are going to interact with a material. And we are gonna take advantage of all three of those things. Because what happens is, if you have a certain material, it will either transmit or reflect or absorb differently for those different wavelengths whether in the visible or the UV or the infrared or for x-rays. And that's the key. The key is different materials respond differently to electromagnetic radiation. And you're familiar with that. There's a difference between looking through a piece of glass and looking through a piece of plastic. Okay? If someone were to hand you something and says, is this glass or plastic, you probably hold it up to the light and say, oh, it's kind of cloudy, it looks like plastic. That's the analysis that we're gonna be doing. Just that. Okay, keep that in, you wanna keep that in mind. All right, we'll move on. So what I wanna do now is just give you a summary of the techniques. I wanna throw it out there, and then what we're gonna do is go through some of these individually, and then examples of those techniques and how they're used in, uh, in an analyzing paintings. So the first is transmission, X radiography. You're very familiar with that when you go to the dentist, when you have a chest X ray. This is X rays that are being transmitted through your body, and the transmission it depends on how uh, the density of the material that it goes through, whether it goes through bone or whether it goes through tissue, shows up differently on the film. Well, we actually also x-ray a lot of other things besides people. So you can do the same thing with infrared and the same thing with the ultraviolet. So that's transmission. So another one is reflection. What we'll do as an experiment or an analysis, we're gonna send x-rays in and detect x-rays that are coming out. X-ray reflection, same thing. Infrared coming in, infrared going out and ultraviolet in, ultraviolet out. Simple reflection. Each of these have different wavelengths, different energies. They're going to react with the materials differently. So we will learn different things depending on what wavelength we're looking at. And that's why you, we have and we take advantage of using the different parts of the spectrum. Now the third one is fluorescence. That's another uh, way you've probably seen the UV light is like a uh, black light. Back in the day, there were lots of black lights and they had the black light posters. And so what would happen is you would have UV light coming in and visible coming off. You see it fluoresce. That's basically what it means. 
We can have UV light coming in, visible coming off. That's one example of fluorescence. We can also have ultraviolet coming in, and uh, so ultraviolet coming in, visible going off. Then there's also X-ray coming in and X-ray going off. Um, and we can also have, instead of just X-rays coming in, we can actually take particles. And we can slam particles into our material and create a situation, and I'll explain this later, in which we get X-ray admission as a result, okay? So I wanna give you a summary, I wanna introduce it. Then we're gonna go through these different techniques. First one, infrared reflectography. So it's in the infrared and it's going to be reflection. How does that work? What we do is we have a source of infrared rays. It hits the material here and then it is reflected off. And then what you do is you have a filter. And so what you can do is if you have this reflection, you may also end up producing some visible fluorescence, but if that's not what you're interested in measuring, you've got to filter out that visible light. There's one very important aspect of physics. You, whenever you do a measurement, you gotta make sure what you're measuring is what you say you're measuring, and you gotta measure what you want to measure. And if you measure something that you don't wanna measure, that's called background, all right? So you have to be careful. You have to think about what's background and try to minimize it. So if you're looking for infrared reflectography, then you need something to get rid of any of the extraneous visible light, so you need a filter, and then you need a detector, so you need an infrared sensitive detector. How does this work for paintings? Okay, if we look at a painting, on the top is varnish, and varnish is transparent to light, or else the painter wouldn't put it on top of his, his or her painting, right? So it's transparent to light, and varnish is also transparent to infrared. It will go through. The next layer, we have the paint layer. So now we know in the visible, when you have light that hits the paint layer, that light is reflected back to you and to your eye, and that's what you see. When you look at a red shirt, it's the red light that is reflected back to you. That's what you see. When you look at the green, it's the green light that's being reflected back to you. That's what you see. What you see is the color that is being reflected off of that surface. So now let's go to the infrared. If we go to the infrared, it's actually pigments and paints, are many of them are transparent to the infrared. That's the advantage of using the infrared. So it's just like the varnish for visible. It doesn't, it just goes right through. So the infrared will go through most of the pigment layer and then go down below to the layer below. And that's the idea. And that's why we use the infrared. So here's an analysis in Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, here are two women that are, uh, you can see the painting that is here that is on an easel, it is being held here, and then there's the source of the infrared is in front of it, and there's a detector there too, okay? You can see the size of it, this is pretty small. It needs to be small. I can't be bringing this, this painting to my accelerator ex you know, lab that's big, right? Okay, so the idea is to carefully scan the painting produce what's called infrared, uh, infrared reflection, and you get what's called a reflectogram. It's an image. There's no colors, it's just going to be darker or lighter, depending on what material it hits. So the study, um, what you wanna do in this case is we're going to look underneath the pigments. So if we look underneath the pigments, for example, I have this piece here of uh, a plastic, and there's actually uh, a tape on the back. 
This actually perfectly explains exactly what we're trying to do in this situation. In the visible, you can see through the plastic to the tape below, but the visible light does not go through the tape. It actually gets reflected from the tape so that I can see it. So the idea is you look with the infrared, you look through the top layers to something below that it, the infrared is going to reflect off of or get absorbed. If it's reflected off of, then you're going to detect the infrared. Okay? If it's getting absorbed, then you see nothing. So where it's getting reflected, then it's going to be very bright. Where it's being absorbed, it's going to be very dark. So I'll send this around. So just think about when you're looking at this, you want to think about how you see through things, the transparency down to a layer where it's no longer transparent. Okay, so I hope you can look at one of the one of these uh, um, monitors. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's the visual. It's a little dark, I'm noticing, but here's the visual. This is Risedale. It's landscape with deer and hunters, and it's uh, about the 1600s, and it's at the LA County Museum of Art. And here next to it is the infrared image that is right here. So what are you seeing? You're seeing light areas, and you're seeing dark areas. Some of those dark areas are where the pigment actually did absorb some of the infrared. And, however, you are seeing, kind of hard to see though, you're seeing highlighted here in red is actually the underdrawing. It is not the pigment itself, it is actually what is underneath the pigment. It is the drawing by the artist before they start. Okay? So, also, I notice this is maybe hard to see. What you're seeing here, if we go back, so here's a, a horse is, uh, okay, where'd it go? There it is. Okay, so here's a horse and there's people and there's trees here and whatnot. But what's in the underdrawing is curious. There's no horse here. <laughs> there's no horse, there's no people, there's no anything. It flows. This is the artist using the flow of these lines to dictate how he's going to get the flow in the drawing. This is an underdrawing. So what he set, starts working on is he starts painting with this underdrawing, and all it is are these flow lines. And so the other is that the art historians have said, well, this is probably done very quickly, freehand, probably very quickly. And if you look back at the drawing, this is also, on the visual, it's also freely done. And that's his style. And so by looking at the underdrawing, we can get a sense of what his style is. All right, so let's look at another, another example. Here's a uh, Raphael, Madonna and Child within the Infant Baptist. And this is a color drawing, visible. So this is in the visible range. Here is the infrared image, is right here. So you can see the underdrawing. Raphael is known for having pretty good uh, underdrawings that are, are fairly complete in, in some sense. You, they also learn there's activity here that is not the same as here. There's activity here back in the landscape that is not the same here. These are changes. So we can then study, and the art historians can study, what are the changes that the painter did along the way? And so Raphael actually was quite true to his uh, uh, um, body images here, but not to the landscape. The other thing that's very interesting about Raphael, and unfortunately this is a little hard to see, is there is actually in the underdrawing, there is a ruler line that goes straight down and a ruler line that goes straight across. Raphael was very good at dividing and geometric thinking about this. It's the way he painted and the way he thought about things. And also, 
this line that's here is, you can see the center here, it's also the line about which the Madonna is twisted, okay? So again, we can use these underdrawings for one, to get the idea of any changes that the painter wanted to do, and also to get a sense of how they, uh, how they, learn, how they uh, think about a drawing, how they think about a painting. And also in Raphael's case, and there are also um, a number of, um, a number of instances and a studies, and here's a whole book that if anybody is interested in about underdrawings. And what you can do is for many of these painters, they had drawings from the painters. And then they had the, uh, now we have, they, the painters didn't intend for the underdrawings to be seen, but now we see them. We can see the underdrawings. And there's also art historians that are evaluating the underdrawings and comparing that to actual drawings and studies that the uh, painters did. So if anybody's interested, I do have a nice book that shows uh, some of those underdrawings. Okay. Let's go on to another technique, x-radiography. This is something, you're, again, you're very familiar with. So we have a situation where there's a source of x-rays and the painting sits on some kind of a structure and then there's a film. So the x-rays go through the whole painting and then we see what, what comes through to the film. So for x-radiography, you come in with a lot of x-rays, you go through a material. If I have a high Z material or a high number of protons or say lead, which is a heavy, heavy material, then I'm not gonna get very many x-rays through. It's just like bone doesn't let uh, many x-rays through. So you're gonna need a dark spot. If you have a very light material, a material that doesn't have very many protons in it, then you're going to get more x-rays through. Okay, and you're gonna get, you're gonna get uh, ex more exposure on the film. So the exposure on the film, just like when you have an x-ray for your body or your teeth, will tell you density differences. Okay, so that's what it's used for. Here's an example, which I think is, this is really a lot of fun, Renoir. Luncheon of the boating party. And this is supposed to be, people have talked about, oh, this is this wonderful picture, this painting of friends that are all having a great time. Okay, so there's a lot of history around this painting. So this is 1881, around 1881, because it did take him quite a while to do this painting. Um, it is located in Washington, D.C. So there's been a whole analysis of this painting. Here's one situation. Let's look at now back in the back, the two men right here. So you have this gentleman who's looking right at you, and you have this gentleman who's looking at the gentleman on his left. So let's zoom in on that, okay? So this here now is an infrared um, uh, image. So here on the, the top shows the visual, and then on the bottom shows the infrared image. And what's really nice here is there's a little bit of an outline that shows indeed when we look at the infrared image, notice the hats look kind of like they were a little higher than before. So it was thought that actually when, Ruff, um, when Renoir painted this, that he, the figures were actually higher on the canvas than they originally were, that he lowered them. There's an awning that is here, and it is thought that actually this awning was added later, and then he had to move his subjects lower. Yeah, kind of interesting, huh? Okay, so another thing is that we also see right here, there's also the hat that is here, and there's a blurring of the face. And actually, if you see it, it is thought that here, this gentleman was actually looking at you, not at his friend. There is a letter that came <laughs> from Renoir to one of his friends, describing a situation that was actually a fallout with a friend. 
And uh, the art historians think that this is actually a result of that. That he changed the painting because he decided he, d he wasn't quite as uh, friends with this person anymore. Okay, so let's look at another part. We'll go back here. Another part of the painting is this woman right here. And she has a poodle with her. So let's look at her. And now let's look at the, um, here, it's an X-radiograph. Okay, so now we're looking in the X-ray. And in here, it's kind of, it's quite blurry. You've got light and dark. But here outlined is actually a person. It's a woman here. And she has, her body is here. Her arm, it's a three-quarter length sleeve. It is not a long sleeve like here. And her arm is actually tucked up. So if you follow the blue outline here, her arm is tucked up like right there. And she's actually, if you look carefully at this analysis and at some other analysis that was done, she's actually looking out. She's not looking to the side. You can still see in here some of the effects of the hat that's here, okay? And here's the gentleman that's behind. He's still the same. Another letter from Renoir to a friend. I'm obliged to go on working on this wretched painting because of a high-class cocotte who had the imp impudence to c come to Chateau wanting to pose. In a word, today I've wiped her out. This is actually, they had the letters. Now that they have the analysis, they found the cocotte. Okay? So a little more art history. There's a lot of changes that went into this painting. So uh, Renoir did a lot of changes on the fly, and we can see that in these analysis. All right, here's another area kind of focused in on the table. And here we have, here's uh, in the visible, here's a glass here, here's a glass here. Um, and in the infrared image, you can see the glass, but here was a wine glass, a stemmed, a stemmed glass was right here. And actually, if you look carefully, you could see the outline of that stemmed glass. Over here was another glass instead of grapes. He decided, for whatever reason, remove the glass, put in the grapes. Uh, and here's another, another glass that used to be there. So it's not known whether or not, because people sat for this uh, picture over a period of time. And it's not known, I mean, certainly the table may have changed over that time. So it's not clear if he actually changed it during the different you know, seatings of people, or if he actually went back to a studio and said, eh, I don't like that, I'm put doing something else, okay? That we don't know. But we do know that he was quite fastidious on the, uh, what was on the table, and he, would, he, he did make these changes. Okay, another analysis. Now we can go to ultraviolet, and this is now ultraviolet to fluorescence. So we're gonna take ultraviolet in, so we're gonna take a light source, an ultraviolet light source, we're gonna hit the material, and we're then going to detect the visible light. So now I want the visible, I don't want the ultraviolet. I've got to have an ultraviolet filter. I've gotta get rid of the ultraviolet, that's not what I wanna measure. I only wanna measure the visible that comes off, the fluorescence that comes off, okay? And what happens is, the reason why this, this is going on is that the ultraviolet radiation excites the molecules up into vibrational energy states and then they have to de-excite. When they de-excite, they give off this, uh, this visible radiation. Okay, so now here's an example using X-ray fluorescence. Here we have this painting here, okay, early 16th century. And Early restorations were not very, not as careful, makes sense, they're not as careful as what we do now. They basically said, they told someone with some paint, go fix it, you know, paint over it. And uh, what we do now, of course, is very carefully scrape off the varnish and try to match the pigments. But here you can see in this painting, there are these dark spots. And these are evidence of where restoration had happened. It's actually an evidence of linseed oil and, and new varnish that had been put on top. 
Okay? So we can use these analysis to say, ah, this painting has been restored. Or you can use this analysis to say this painting has been damaged. And if it's been damaged, how do we best restore it? So this is another way in to get some information about painting. Here's another, another technique, induced x-ray emission. So what we have here is a, a particle is coming in. This is a picture of a nucleus in the center. And this is your sort of typical atom that is described as a nucleus in the center with protons and neutrons and electrons that are orbiting around, okay? That is one model. It is not a modern model, but it, it is one model that we use for the atom. And for this purpose, it works very well. So what we have here is a situation where something is coming in and disturbing an electron that is in a very lower energy or a, a state that is close to the nucleus. If I give it enough energy, I can knock it out of its position. Okay, it's like billiard balls, just like what this picture looks like. If I can give it enough energy, I will excite that electron, and if I, it's enough energy, it'll send it out away from the whole nucleus. It will not be in the atom anymore. Okay, and now what will happen is an electron that's in a higher state will come down and fill that hole. Things like to be in its lowest energy state. So what you'll have is a situation where the electrons from the higher energy levels will come down and fill in the holes. And by doing that, it has to emit energy because it's going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And the way that it has to emit energy is through these x-rays. So now we can look at the x-rays. And these x-rays are very specific energy x-rays, very specific wavelengths. So we go back to that spectrum. If I can measure which wavelengths came off, then I know what energy levels was transitioned between. And it turns out that every atom has a fingerprint. Every atom, you can identify zinc, you can identify chrome, you can identify bromine, you can identify materials by looking at the x-ray fingerprint. And why? Because you'll have a different um, number of protons and neutrons in here, and these energy levels, they're going to be slightly different for every atom. Because every atom has a different number of neutrons and protons. Okay? So for every element, we're going to have a different signature. This is a way that we can identify materials that are in pigments. And so pigments that are made in the ancient time are made differently than pigments that are made now. And so we can actually do an analysis of the pigments and determine exactly what's what. So here, now we go. Here's a pigment composition. This is x-ray fluorescence. So the painting is sideways here, and it's in a contraption. You can see, just like in uh, an earlier situation, it's held here. The apparatus here is to send in x-rays and then there are detectors to measure those x-rays and to measure the energy spectrum. When you looked in that spectrometer and you were looking at the lines that are different colors, this is a detector that looks at lines of different x-rays. And so this is Degas. And what they found is, lo and behold, here's the visual spectrum right here. And if we kind of go in on this dotted line, Look what's here. This is in the infrared radiograph. There's another picture. There's a picture underneath that painting. Okay? It is a portrait of a woman, and she's upside down. <laughs> um, so we can look at infrared reflection. So looking at infrared radiograph, we get this picture. Looking at the infrared reflection, notice we get more we can get more information. So what happens is here, what happens is over the time, the thin paints, the paint sort of starts to thin, and you can start to see the painting that's on from underneath. So they actually had a clue that something may have been underneath. And that's what you can see in this infrared uh, reflection 
is actually right in here. You can start to see the head and the hair of the portrait that is underneath. And that started to show through, and you could see it better in the infrared. But now let's look at pigment composition. So when we were looking at a drawing that was underneath, we wanted to look through the pigments and get to the charcoal that's underneath, because that charcoal is going to absorb the uh, infrared. In this case, what we're doing is we're actually looking at a specific place, and we're looking at the composition that is in that position. Now, if you go and you look and you see chromium, well, chromium is supposed to be in yellow. If you don't see yellow, something else has to be there giving the chromium, giving that yellow. It's underneath. So what they do is you have a whole analysis. Here's the analysis. Here's for calcium, chromium, all the different, uh, all the different elements here. And you can get a density measurement of all those elements. You take that information. And then you do, here's an XRF analysis of the woman, of course, turned back up, you know, right side up, and a color reconstruction. And this is what they expect from the analysis of the pigments. They can then determine what color was there and then do a color reconstruction. So this is portrait of a woman with a woman underneath. So it's actually a portrait of two women, one underneath, one on top. Okay, another example, Van Gogh. He painted in the Netherlands in his early years. He went to Paris. When he went to France, he started to realize when he saw the Impressionists, all these beautiful colors that they were using. And he was very much attracted to that. And here's Patch of Grass in 1887 in his uh, France years. He also didn't have much money. And so he painted over old pictures. Here's an example. So here's Patch of Grass, which has a whole lot of color in it. And here's a portrait from two years earlier that was found underneath. And it's from his Netherland days, and it's a lot of dark colors. So here's a way for art historians to understand the development that Van Gogh went through right in his own painting. He never thought, he also was very particular. He also probably didn't really want this painting to be public. It's a good thing he's not around, I guess, to see it, that we've now revealed what's, what he's been hiding all these years. There are a number of paintings that have been analyzed, Van Gogh paintings, and paintings that have been found underneath, reused canvases. All right, another way we can use XRF is, uh, that's X-ray fluorescence, is actually to, again, identify pigments. And if you identify a pigment, and there's a composition of a pigment that couldn't have been there at the time of the painting, that painting can't be real. Here's an example. Beltraki was, uh, he was caught. He painted, he took, what he did was he uh, took this uh, artist and this artist actually had a series of paintings in his early years and a series of paintings in his later years. Perfect. He just filled it in. He filled in these middle years with paintings of his own and then passed them off as, his, as this guy's painting. Because what he could do is say, well, this was the early year period. Here's the late year period. I'll just do some kind of combination of the two. And it'll be kind of, you know, it'll be accepted, it'll be fine. And that's exactly what he did. Problem is, when he painted it, he used titanium white. Titanium white was not available in 1914. And so when there was somebody kind of questioned this painting and had it analyzed. And sure enough, titanium showed up and there's just no way that it could have been authentic. So here's a way of authentic, you know, doing an authentic uh, analysis. So this is also what can be done in a number of paintings. And so what you can do is uh, you can actually take someone's painting and say, does it make sense that it is from this workshop or from this artist? And by looking at the underneath, you can look at the techniques. 
And you could say, well, we know for sure this one is from that artist. Let's look at this one. And if you look at the underneath techniques, you can actually see how they're the same or different. So it's a way of, a, another way of getting to the authentication. So here's a summary of techniques. But this is the same, same slide as I showed earlier. There's transmission. We have reflection, x-ray, infrared, and ultraviolet. Fluorescence, using x-ray fluorescence, uh, ultraviolet, and particle-induced x-ray emission called PIXI. Um, that's actually, for particle-induced x-ray emission, that's where we do actually get the accelerator. <laughs> so that you actually throw accelerators at the, uh, at the picture itself. Um, so I didn't quite go into that. Um, I can talk a little bit about that situation. Um, but this is a summary of the techniques, many of which we've talked about. And uh, you've seen some examples of each of these things. So in general, nuclear physics and the arts provides techniques. Uh, we can use not just for an analyzing paintings. There are a number of other, other uses that this can do be, both in painting, uh, authenticating geographic origin, looking at composition of materials, where would those materials be from? Uh, materials are different from different mines, so you can actually identify metals based on mines and, and regions. So, and now uh, you can follow Roman coins that way. Where were they? Where would they start? Determine the age of the objects, characteristics and content of materials. You can uh, establish how things were constructed. What layers are there? Uh, history of artifacts. Uh, we talked about what's below the surface. You can identify forgeries, and you can look at illegible writing by looking at not the visible, but looking at the infrared. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Who's got questions? Who wants to know how they can get some good art tested? You bought something, and now you're wondering, right? So uh, the way Q&A works is I've got a microphone, and Carrie there in the back will have a microphone. We'll move the mics around and try to get to as many questions as we can. Let's get started. Hi, thanks for your talk. Is there a practical limit to how many layers you can look? So for example, if an artist painted over something multiple times and there were several images, can you, can you pull apart all of those? That makes it harder. The, the answer would be yes, but the analysis is a lot harder. So what you would have to do is you would have to separate and say, okay, this is from one place, this is from another place, or what are all the possible materials? And you would have to use more than just x-ray fluorescence. You would have to then use the infrared reflect, uh, reflectography. And so you would have to use multiple ways, multiple analyses, and say, okay, at this point, this is what I see in this uh, region of the spectrum, this is what I see from this, these are the pigments, uh, the materials that uh, that I had. It would be hard. It would it would just add more to trying to, you know, separate all the layers. But it would be possible. Hello. Hi. Great speech or uh, presentation. I got a question um, regarding um, damage to the paintings from radiation. Absolutely. How do you mitigate that? Absolutely. So um, when you worry about say X-rays to the tissue. We worry about damage to the tissue because what happens is in that picture that I showed, we're knocking out electrons. We're ionizing those electrons, those atoms, and so therefore you could cause chemical uh, damage. So the actual uh, amount of what, um, it's called dose, radiation dose for people, but the, uh, we also can consider, quote, uh, the, the, um, the rate. It's really small and it is carefully controlled. So it is something that definitely has to be thought about. Um, you don't want to be exposing the painting to ultraviolet also, because you can also uh, age the painting. Because actually, there's, this is a whole other issue is uh, mostly for chemists, that the pigments, they are interacting. You can get pigments interacting with the varnish. You can get pigments interacting with pigments of the wash that was underneath. Or you could get an interaction of a pigment with a pigment next to it. And you can get chemical reactions, and you can start to get fading, and uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you won't see the same color. 
said UV can also cause some of that damage too. So yes, definitely has to be thought about. Thanks very much. Really interesting. Um, and I'm eager to see the book afterwards. Okay. Afterwards. Um, in any case, th this could be called applied nuclear physics. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if there are ways in which the work in the applied world has generated insights that have shaped more basic understandings in nuclear physics. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think technique is really where what it's at. Um, the techniques that have been developed, the um, detector development, for example, but now if you go to nuclear medicine, a lot of what the, uh, uh, there's a lot of detector development and algorithm development. So um, the woman asked about uh, trying to, to get the three different layers, right? So when you do nuclear medicine, you take radiation that you're either uh, putting a, a radioactive source in someone and you're looking at the radiation going through, or you're looking at radiation going through the whole part. And you only want to look at a small part within. You have to actually figure out all the information from all the different slices and reconstruct that. So reconstruction algorithms to actually decode and stuff was developed far faster within the nuclear medical community than it was in the nuclear physics community because that's what th they were motivated. So, and also detection uh, de and detectors, technology. So a lot of work was done in nuclear medicine. That then we moved back over to uh, nuclear physics. Um, and there's companies that they develop detectors for nuclear medicine, nuclear physics. So we can drive, say, precision in one way, but nuclear technology for uh, other motivations will drive that the detectors in another way and, and drive that, uh, drive that, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, forgers fascinate me. Um, presumably the very best forgers know that you're going to be using these techniques to try and catch them. Uh, are they modifying their forgery techniques to take account of what's going on? And do you kind of end up in an arms race with the forgers? <laughs> right, just like a uh, computer cybersecurity race, right? How, how do you stay ahead of the hackers? Um, I would think so. Uh, that's actually what the um, restorers are doing, the curators. Because when they're trying to restore paintings, they're trying to think about using pigments that are more akin to what was used before. So I would expect that now, these techniques, 1960s was a pretty much the start, and now with a lot of development going on, um, in the 90s, the 2000s, that, that forgery was found in the 2000s. So I would think, I would think they would get smart and try to mix up the old paints. But it's hard, there are some times you can't get those old paints, yeah? And also the materials, you would have to do everything. You would have to make sure, because um, what we saw, one reason why we could see the, the underdrawings for um, these Flemish painters is the fact that they use charcoal and it has chalk on their base. And so the chalk with the infrared is very reflective and then the charcoal for their underdrawing is absorptive. So then you can really see these dark lines and it's easier to see. So if you're gonna do a Flemish forgery, you're also gonna have to be good about making sure you construct it correctly because someone's gonna be looking at that construction too. So yes, they're gonna have to work hard. They're gonna have to earn their money. So I'm curious, well, what makes a physicist interested in art history? <laughs> so um, coming at it in a couple of different ways, um, I teach undergrads and I also have interactions with high school students. And I am finding more and more the high school students and even my undergrads, they don't always know this intersection. The impact of science on culture. 
This has been true over, you know, the millennia. Uh, how does physics interact with philosophy? How, you know, uh, back in the day, you couldn't separate the two. Um, how, how is culture impacted? And how does science impact into culture and art? And I started by giving lectures and looking into applied nuclear physics beyond the obvious medical physics and beyond the obvious security. Um, there's a lot of uh, applied work that also I am involved with is uh, finding nuclear materials for security reasons. We don't want, you know, dirty bombs coming in. We don't want uh, nuclear materials. So you, you may have to find nuclear materials. So that's a nuclear security. So that's another sort of obvious application. But what are the less obvious ones? And I started looking into it, and that's how I got started. But I also, um, I, I also have to blame my husband, who is very much into art history, <laughs> and he has taught me quite a bit. And so the influence also from him. I, I should say credit, not blame. I'm sorry. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of the old paintings are dar have darkened with age. I understand that's a combination of soot from candles, which were used to light the areas in those days before electric lights and so forth. And some of it is uh, uh, apparently due to the varnish itself uh, changing colors as it gets old, it gets darker. How, how do you account for what should be done when, when a painting is restored? So there's a whole um, a study chemi you know, for chemistry to study this, how the varnish is actually interacting. Um, the other is how to take off that varnish when they do restorations. And um, I did come across uh, you know, a study that basically that's what they did. There's uh, a painting that if you look at the old, uh, the old version, then it was quite dark and the, the varnish. They actually s carefully stripped off that varnish and they uh, cleaned up the painting and then put on a new varnish. Um, oh, it, it's a whole study unto itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, it keeps the, uh, so that would be for the uh, American Chemical Society. A lot of these uh, articles come out of the Chemical Society uh, journals and that's their applied chemistry. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're gonna do one more question. Go right ahead. Um, my question sort of relates to the other questions that have come up. Um, when you're looking at the, the elements that are within the paint, you're looking also at what was in the room with them um, and what was in the air, dust, and my artwork often gets cat hairs in it. Um, so I'm wondering, um, because we have so many hydrocarbons in the air and so many other pollutants now, can you detect fraud by finding those kinds of things mixed in with the paint. That would be hard, but yeah, I mean that would be one way if we can get the analysis to be that specific, but that's actually, there's a, a certain amount that you're gonna need in order to detect, and that would probably be pretty hard. We'd have to get uh, a little bit more, uh, more precision. What's happening is by making the process more mobile, so, um, I can't resist mentioning. There's a, there's a, this is another thing that I just thought was so much fun. There's a particle accelerator that's in the basement of the Louvre in Paris, okay? I mean, that would be the great place to work. Um, <laughs> it's a dedicated particle accelerator for art uh, and cultural heritage. So they can actually take the painting and bring it down to the basement and then do their analysis um, and do a very, very good precision analysis and then bring it back up and get it back. They, they actually work overnight so that the painting is back when the people come in. Um, but when you have these mobile and small devices, they're not as precise. And they just, what you would have to, probably to get something like that, you would have to go to something, a place like the Louvre and uh, their accelerator to do a more precise analysis. But maybe someday there'll be better uh, development of uh, technology to do that. 
Let's give her one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out tonight. Yeah, all the way from Durham, y'all. She took I-40 to get here. So, so thanks a lot for doing that for us. And hey, thanks to all of you for coming out to the Science Cafe. I hope that you learned something cool and interesting, like how to forge a painting, and that you'll come back again and see us here at the cafe again. But hey, before next Thursday, there's something you're going to want to check out. This Saturday, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., is a very special day at the museum. We're going to be celebrating the life and work of Charles Darwin. This Saturday is Darwin Day here at the museum, so we're going to have a museum full of... Uh, games and crafts for little ones, and you can get science presentations and meet scientists who are continuing to use the principles of natural selection in their work every single day. So come back out, meet scientists, play games, do crafts and other activities. There's a lot of cool science presentations that are going to be going on that day as well in the Daily Planet Theater and in Windows on the World, I think, as well. So all over, there's going to be fun stuff to do all day this Saturday. And if I don't see you then, I know that I will, but if I don't see you then, I'll see you next Thursday here at the Science Cafe. Good night, everybody.